Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you an audio only interview with Rob Sarney and David Stubbers, and they're talking all about living reef memorials, which are actually reef balls that are created using the cremated remains of loved ones that can be dropped in the ocean as a foundation for new coral reefs to grow. Really fascinating. I think you'll be interested in this. So if you haven't subscribed, yet, be sure to do that down below. Also subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you happen to listen, leave a rating and review. And if you're so inclined, go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find out how you can make a small contribution to keep this show on the air. Thanks in advance if you decide to do that. So we'll move on now with my conversation with Rob and David. Today, I'm happy to welcome two guests who are here to talk with me about living reef memorials. Um, I'm welcoming Rob Sarney, who is the lead biologist at Living Reef Memorial, and David Stubbers, who's in charge of marketing uh, for the company. So Rob and David, thanks for joining me and welcome. Good afternoon, and thanks for, thanks having, for having us, Karen. Yeah, I'm really excited to learn about the work you're doing because I've I know absolutely nothing about it, and I'm assuming most of the listeners won't really know much about it either. So I thought I'd ask you to just talk to me about what is a living reef memorial, and what, well, what does that mean? If I would like to answer that question for you, um, for the environment, a living reef memorial is a scientifically engineered artificial reef that mimics habitat of very specific species of marine life, typically those that have been impacted by humans. Now, for the, for the, for the families, a living reef is a permanent and, and everlasting place to have your cremated remains, a final resting place, if you will, one that'll never be molested one that'll always remain in the same place and one that you can count on to be there forever. So that that's kind of answers that in, in, in two different ways, because we must think of the environment as we do our own families, because they are part of our family. It is where we live. So the reef is actually, it's a physical structure that you place in the ocean that then provides a habitat for all sorts of marine life. Exactly, um, exactly. How are um, ashes or cremains incorporated into that, into that reef? Well, uh, essentially what happens is when, when we get, your, uh, get cremains, we will incorporate those cremains into a compound that an organ organic compound comprised of crushed seashells, sand, and a little bit of low alkaline concrete. And we mix the cremains separately or individually within the reef. So we'll pour a little, we'll cast a little bit of the reef, and then we'll mix the cremains with our material and then cast that as well, and then finish off the reef. So the cremains are contained within inside the reef and are part of the structure that makes the reef. Wow, so this is a really interesting alternative for disposition of cremains um, in a way that's something really positive and helpful for the ocean environment. Well, we cleverly disguise our reefs as a green burial alternative, but in reality, they're a very vital tool that I use to rehabilitate our coastal marine environments, those that have had a negative human impact. You know, our coastal waters are the hardest hit simply because uh, it is the easiest and uh, the closest for fishermen to get to. And so our coastal waters are, are, are we're not gonna see any decrease in the consumption of ocean resources. What we will see is an increase in consumption and so if I was a farmer and I needed to make my farm more biologically productive, then I need to implement some kind of technology. 
And so since we're really not giving back to the ocean with regard to, you know, uh, 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 aquacultures that provide just for the sea, I don't know of one really that, that does just that, that is a for-profit firm. We really need to find ways to give back to that ocean and to make it back to the biodiversity it was prior to the overfishing because we're losing uh, the species extinction rates. Is, we've never seen extinction rates as high as we have in, in, in our century. And we, as a result, the biodiversity in our oceans is becoming less and less. And that biodiversity is a number of species per given area. And so what we're seeing is a lot of invasive, uh, non-indigenous species. We're seeing uh, these huge imbalances within our own ecosystems as a result of overfishing one species over another. Uh, there have been many cases like that. Uh, in, in our waters here, we see uh, in Southern California, our uh, degradation of the, the kelp forests, which is a natural nursery for so many species of, you know, from microbial really to pelagic. Uh, uh, and we see those kelps disappearing. And we see them disappearing for uh, a couple keynote, uh, due to a couple keynote species. And in our case, one of them is the lobster, oddly enough. Uh, the, the, the lobsters in our area are heavily farmed as they are in many places. But lobsters also, they consume, uh, they're not just uh, scavengers, they're, they're also predatory. And they prey on the, uh, on the uni or the, 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 the urchin. And urchin is one of the species, in addition to nudibranchs and so on, that will eat the bottom of the bo brown, uh, the bottom of the kelp, the steadfast of our brown algae that comprises our kelp forest. They'll eat that. And, and they're pretty much like locusts in that in the, they will consume everything. And so we have this huge imbalance uh, within our own marine, co marine ecosystem in this part of the world as a result of that, as that overfishing one, that one species. So we implement in our, in our reefs uh, lobster habitat. And the lobster, you have to understand that the lobster likes, uh, uh, likes to have its feelers out. It likes to have a centimeter to two centimeters around its thorax likes to have a, uh, an escape hatch and the older ones generally like to be at a higher sub, a higher altitude from the substrate than the juveniles. So of course we make the holes at the top a little bigger uh, for the large, larger bugs. But also the goby and the jack and a lot of the bait fish uh, that are missed in, in a lot of these uh, fish counts. You know, they, they're going for these, uh, they're, they're counting a lot of the sport fishing uh, catches and unfortunately if it wasn't for the smaller species we wouldn't have the larger it's all tied in together and so when we design these reefs we design them with that in mind uh, getting back this imbalance that now we've we've created thus helping to heal our our, our water does that, does that make sense so you're saying like the reefs that you designed and I saw pictures of some and they seem to be kind of pyramid shaped but with lots yeah. of openings around the side so that's actually where the lobster would live inside that inside that reef is that in, lobsters or other fish would live there exactly they would live within the voids that are created these are uh the ones that you're speaking of are, are six-sided sloped at 23 and a half degrees and then we we create uh holes if you will within the walls of the reef and we actually use fruit, old fruit, uh, to create those voids. Everything, uh, including the molds that we use, are, are all recycled materials, by the way. Uh, we, we don't, uh, we don't our, our footprint is very, very low on the environment. We use uh, things that would normally be thrown away. Uh, we use them to create reefs with. And what I mean by that is just the molds. Um, the, the shells we get off the beach and, and are crushed responsibly and then return to the sea. Same with the sand. The concrete is a very low alkaline concrete. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, when the reef is fully hydrated or cured, it has the same pH as the sea, which is about seven and a quarter percent. 
Oh, so interesting. And so this, it makes sense to me that, um, like someone who, who had a loved one who loved the ocean and loved the sea and had considered scattering ashes in the sea, this might actually be a much more beneficial use for those cremains to contribute them to a living reef instead, which would, you know, rather than just be dispersed in the ocean would, would actually help, um, help heal the ocean in some sense and restore some of the biodiversity. Well, it helps, you know, we can't forget the families. Remember this, the environment and the family, right? And what we found is that it goes across all different spectrums, whether they be divers, teachers, uh, we've even had politicians. We had one Air Force general. And so it, it, you don't have to be um, necessarily uh, a pronounced uh, environmentalist to, to appreciate the ecological benefits that the reefs provide. Uh, it turns out everyone is concerned about the health of our ocean. And if they can, most of our clients, they have a great sense of pride knowing that their loved one is going to help be help help our heal our ocean and and become an environmental and civic asset to the communities that they lived in and and in fact i had one lady while we're deploying her her 24 year old son had passed and that that's just a tragic situation as we're deploying her son she's cracking jokes um and and that told me that she had enough solace within her heart that she, she this eased her pain because it's what he wanted. It's what his fa the family wanted. And it's, it, it's going to provide something that is a positive legacy for the next generation. And that, you know, we have a saying around here that a heart filled with pride leaves little room for grief. And it's quite true. You know, the people that find, find us and use our services, they find a lot of solace in, in, in this particular way of, of dealing with their, their loved one's cremains. So talk me through this. Um, after someone, after you create the reef and incorporate um, the cremains into the reef, then you take the reef out on a boat, right, to the place where you're going to deploy it. And does, do the family members accompany you? And is there some sort of service that takes place at that time? Well, uh, I, you know, you're asking a, a very, very typical question. What, what's the process? And the process is, uh, uh, in a nutshell, where you are to obviously get us those cremains. You can order this online. But when you when you, uh, you can either hand deliver the cremains to one of our facility or a lot of people choose to send them. And I, I recommend the United States Postal Service because they do a wonderful job with cremains. But you must tell them there's cremains contained within. And I tell the client when they do send them via the post to provide me with that tracking number right away so that we can ensure that they're in the system and that we have a date where they're going to arrive. And when they do arrive, the client is notified every step of the way. I'll call the client or email the client if they're not available to tell them that those cremains arrived uh, safely and that, that we have taken legal custody of those cremains and have implemented a positive chain of custody policy. And what that means is that through the entire process, everything is documented with either affidavits of fact, photographs, or videotape. We love to use videotape because it's irrefutable. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, we videotape the, the creation of the reef and the uh, deployment of the reef. So that way, you know that those cremains are in that reef and that's the reef being deployed into the sea. And each reef that we create is unique. It may have the same overall uh, shape, However, we adorn them with very specific types of shells in addition to tagging each one so we know for proof positive that those, re those cremains are in that reef and that's the reef going into the sea because we would never want a mistake. And so 
what happens is we have some paperwork that we have to take care of with the government. So it takes us about a week after we take custody for them to be transported to our facility. Once they're at our facility, the reef is then created. And of course, the family is aware of that because we let them know a day ahead of time. Once that's done, it takes about 30 days for the material to cure or hydrate. Uh, during that time, we can schedule a deployment date that might be good for the family. Some families wish to view the deployment in person. And in this particular location, that is done via a charter. Uh, they don't allow, the government doesn't allow us to take any, any people on our research vessel. Uh, and you wouldn't want to go on it anyway. It's a work boat. It's been engineered to, to do one thing, and that is to study and deploy the reefs. And so it's more of a dive boat and a laboratory than anything else. Not to mention, we would want to, some families would want a hosted bar or catering and, and you know, up to uh, maybe 100 people or even 50 people. And, and without having a fleet of vessels to accommodate every request, we farm that out to have vetted charters who have been in the business a very long time and who make us look just fabulous uh, because of the services that they provide. So if a family wanted to view the deployment in person, that is certainly recommended and we have an ability to do that. We do that during the summer months only so that we can assure that the weather is perfect for that special day. And I should mention that you, you are located in San Diego, um, California. Is that the only place that you do these deployments? Uh, no, we, we have several stores. Um, we have Vancouver, Canada, a beautiful location in the Georgia Strait. Uh, and in that location, that is, that is also uh, rather seasonal in that uh, it gets cold and you... you you certainly wouldn't want to be out there in the freezing rain and so on. So we try and schedule these deployments during the summer months so the families can watch. And in that location, uh, oftentimes you can watch from the shore. There's no need to charter a vessel. Um, and I might add that we could also do a live stream. All the vessels have equipment on board to do live streaming to either a messenger or something like that. And uh, I also might add, to, uh, you know, we do, like I said, we do videotape everything. So when the entire process is finished and the, the reef has been installed into the sea, we post onto YouTube an edited version that includes the location of the time and the date uh, uh, of the deployment. And of course, a dedication to that, to that individual. Uh, and the videos, are posted to YouTube so they can easily share them with family and friends. And then that would always remain up until the family doesn't wish it to be up any longer. And then of course we would, we would do anything that they'd like, whether it take it off or make it private. But we found that this is the easiest way for families to, um, to share with, with other loved ones, uh, this unique experience. And um, just one thought that comes to my mind, uh, say if um, my father's cremains are contained in one of these living reefs, if I were a scuba diver, is that something you say you tag each reef? Would I be able to find it? Would I be able to have a, a little map if I wanted to dive down and see it? Is that possible? Absolutely. And but yeah, here's, here's the caveat to that. You know, people, they, they some... Uh, you wouldn't recognize one of these reefs after a little while of it being in the water, uh, simply because it becomes part of the natural ecosystem and they grow over time as it becomes colonized. So it no longer looks as this, this bare piece of concrete, really this great thing. But after just a short time, uh, you wouldn't recognize it. And this is why I tell people about the memorial plaques that we offer, that it's kind of pointless because A, fish can't read, and and B, <laughs> it'll be covered by, by marine life very quickly anyway. And so save your money, and, and we offer it, and some people insist, and, and of course we would accommodate. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be covered within a couple of days anyway. 
So mm. there's really no point in, in, in spending that extra money. And if they wanted to come see, see the reef, absolutely. We take very accurate GPS locations of each reef. And for the, re the reason for that is that we go back every year and do surveys of all the reefs to document their behavior and to see their progression and to do our fish counts. And what I mean by a fish count is essentially prior to us uh, placing one single reef in this, in any area, uh, we do our studies to see what's there first, right? And to see if it's even a candidate for our reefs. And usually the biodiversity is very, very low. And so what we found is that through our fish counts and through, through the years of these reefs being in the water, is that indigenous populations have returned thousands fold where they wouldn't have otherwise. And that, that it, it increases that area's biological diversity and thus its biological production, which is a, a great benefit to our coastal waters because that means they're working, you know. Yeah, that's fantastic to know that you have that follow-up information to verify that it really does make a difference. In well, as a biologist, I really got to be able to prove our claims that these are of benefit. You know, of course, the government would never give us permission to do this if they weren't or if the technology wasn't proven. However, you know, it, empirical testing is really where the rubber meets the road. How well do these perform and what do they actually do? And our, what we found, we have to hire firms that actually do this for us. They don't trust us, which is good. Uh, and and what, what we found is uh, far more biologically productive than, than we initially uh, thought it would on paper. So this empirical testing, the, 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 uh, the fish counts are vital tool that we use to see if there's any changes that we need to make or to document uh, what species are, are within it. And for example, uh, we found some abalone recently. Uh, actually, the firm found uh, abalone within our reefs. Uh, abalone in this part of the world are endangered. And so uh, we had no idea that the abalone would like our reefs. We, we, we never designed them for abalone, but here they are and they absolutely love them. And they love them for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of which they're, you know, the, the reef is mainly made out of calcium carbonate. And so algae likes to have three things, calcium carbonate, CO2, and uh, uh, photo, uh, uh, sunlight. And so we provide obviously the calcium carbonate. So soon these reefs, they're placed within the photozoic zone. So soon they're just covered with algae. And everybody comes to consume the algae giving it basically a jump start, And this happens within just a couple of days. It's amazing the transformation and how fast things will, things will attach themselves, marine life will attach themselves quicker to a calcium carbonate substrate than let's say granite or any other type of substrate, uh, simply because that's the material in which they, 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 they were built from. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're not gonna attach themselves to a concrete structure just alone, simply because the chemical makeup of the concrete is generally of a lower pH than the seawater, making it too acidic. And, and that would repel or anti foul uh, uh, marine life to, to, to colonize the reef. So it's very important to have it also chemically conducive to the species that we're going for. And that's one reason why we use the calcium carbonate or crushed seashells uh, as an aggregate for, for, to hold everything together. Plus, it goes right back to the ocean. You know, like I said, this company is very e ecologically minded, even so much so is that our vessel that, we've, that we use, we've designed and we've built to do this one thing. And it, it's a sailboat. It's a catamaran. Uh, and it... it we have uh, engines on board, but we feel it's a more fitting uh, to sail out there, not burn petroleum products in the deployment method. And along the way, the boat is designed to pick up trash. So we lower that front trampoline, and uh, as we're going down the road, it picks up trash. So it's kind of a double whammy for the environment 
uh, by having this vessel out there. Wow, I just, I have to say, <clears throat> this is really heartening news. It's so good for a change to be hearing about something that's improving biodiversity and improving part of our environment at this time when most of the news we hear is so discouraging about all the species becoming extinct. And so to think that there's actually something that we could do that has a positive impact in a short time, um, that I just find that's very hopeful. It's extremely hopeful. The, the research that we, uh, our conclusions have been that this is not just beneficial, but it's creating uh, a biomass that is was larger than 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 before than before the overfishing, because these vertical structures weren't there. Now, it, does it displace other habitat? Well, it, uh, we're, we'll take one in, in ex for example the um, uh, the halli the halibut. Halibut likes to have a lot of sandy substrate you know, in order to, to, to bury themselves and so on and so forth. We leave plenty of that within and around the reefs and placement of the reefs in, uh, in relation to each other is very important because we want to leave uh, enough, ha enough of the indigenous habitat there as not to impact that species, but to improve it. And it's improving it because they're, they're predatory the halibut's predatory species is small bait fish. And that's, that's the, 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 these are designed for a lot of the smaller species of marine life that are not commercially farmed, but are in support of a lot of the ones that are, for mm -hmm. example, like the, the tuna and, you know, the, the goby, uh, the jack, a, a lot of those uh, bait fish, uh, this is a natural nursery for 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 those species and so with with a natural nursery and, and the perfect habitat for them to lay their eggs and spawn uh what is now there where it wasn't before making that area more biologically diverse and thus more biologically productive and again the consumption levels they're not decreasing we have got to do something to give back to this seed to make it to make it healthy again and because we're we're not going anywhere right and the ocean if we just keep depleting it we won't be here literally we need this ocean in so many different ways uh not not just for oxygen generation but i mean it's a it's a food so source for so many millions and it, it, w without this ocean we wouldn't survive mm -hmm. and so it's vital that we we repair some of the damage and make the next generation have a um, hope for a healthy marine ecosystem. And I'm afraid the generations prior to have, have given us uh, a, an ecological debt that the next generation has to pay. And this helps to mitigate that mm -hmm. in, in a great way. And I might also add that, you know, because of the, the company that Living Reef Memorial is, is owned by, um, we, we have a number of ecological projects. And we take the, anything above and beyond costs for this project and donate it to our sister company, Sea Turtle Rescue, seaturtlerescue.org. Seaturtlerescue.org has been in operation since 2002. And last year, we were able to get out 50,000 baby sea turtles that otherwise wouldn't have survived. And we do this through uh, a number of hatcheries where we'll pay the poachers uh, in Nicaragua, northwestern Nicaragua, very economically oppressed and dangerous part of the world. Uh, we'll pay the poachers uh, to bring us the eggs and uh, to, to train them how to do that and thus creating an income generating stream for the local people who would otherwise uh, either feed them to their pigs or sell them on the open market to restaurants and Asia. And so what we found is those that don't sell to us are being disparaged by those who do. And that was an added benefit I didn't think would happen. So essentially what happens is the, re the, the eggs come to us 
Uh, either we get them ourselves or we buy them. They're placed in a hatchery where we monitor the temperature and the humidity and we place them in sterile bags, sterile sandbags, uh, where we're able to reduce the mortality rate. And in the wild, mortality rate is very, very high. Only three to 7% of the turtles actually make it, the hatchlings actually make it to the sea. Uh, that's with indigenous predation. With non-indigenous predation, we can count on 100% not making it to the sea. So last year, our, our success rate was 96.4%. We were able to get out 96.4% with a very low mortality rate. Uh, and that, that's unheard of in the industry. And that's due to the techniques that we've developed over uh, two decades of, of, of doing this type of work. And uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is that uh, the numbers are starting to come back. Uh, we've been doing this at the same location for so long that we're able to uh, find changes in the data. And what we've seen in changes in the data is that more numbers are, are coming back to the beaches that we're doing this activity in than in other beaches where it's just poaching. Mm. So that, that's kind of an added benefit. And of course, we always release one nest of baby sea turtles in the deceased name. Uh, as, I don't know, as a kind of a tribute to those that made it possible. Because without the sale of these reefs, not only would this habitat project not, uh, habitat rehabilitation project for the marine environment not, not be uh, in operation, but sea turtle rescue wouldn't be saving as many sea turtles as we do. And it's, it's due to the, to the people who have this, affinity for the sea and who want to help and who want to have this permanent and beautiful kind of legacy for their loved one. Wow. That's, uh, that's even more exciting. I mean, I love the idea that you're, you're creating habitats for biodiversity in the sea, but then also rescuing baby sea turtles and all of this it is made possible financially because of, uh, of the desire to use these reefs as a memorial for our loved ones. And it's just, it's really the perfect scenario as far as I can see. I think a lot of, uh, you know, there, there are many ways in which someone may um, find a final disposition for cremated remains. You know, there's ash scattering and, and so on and so forth. And, and that's, oddly, that's ecologically, that's okay in, in limited numbers. And, and uh, so to allow diffusion. Um, but there aren't a whole lot of products out there that are, for the final dis the disposition of cremains, permanent, that are ecologically beneficial. Uh, I, I support those that want to do the tree. I think that's absolutely, I love trees. Uh, would uh, love to have more trees. But if the ocean is more your thing, then certainly consider the living reef because it will benefit forever. And we need that, you know, uh, the next generation is at, a, at a, we, we didn't leave them very well. We left them with a lot of debt. And I don't mean economic debt, I mean environmental debt. They need a clean environment to survive and thrive. And, you know, we haven't had the best policies and practices uh, in the past for our environment. The environment wasn't number one, it was always economics. And in this case, it's more the environment first. You know, people ask me, well, why don't you make these into look like a sea turtle or something, or something more aesthetically pleasing. And I tell them that I don't design them for people. I design them to be as biologically productive as possible so that we can change this imbalance that we have in our marine local marine ecosystems and they go, Oh, okay. And then, you know, I, at, at the end of the day, you wouldn't recognize one of these things after being in the water just a short time because they, 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 they transform into a form all of, all of their own with, with all kinds of different species. And when you, when you think of a reef, don't think of like a, just a, a species specific, like a coral reef. 
that may just have just coral polyps. This has hundreds of species of marine life, you know, from, from, from microbial, right, all the way to open water or pelagic species of marine life that, that uh, visit our reefs. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the location couldn't be more picturesque. Uh, 12 miles south of the uh, mouth of San Diego Bay, uh, near an, uh, a small chain of, of islands called the Los Coronados Islands. Uh, they're, they're actually in Mexican waters, but it's like three miles from the border. And they're the only islands that you can see from the city of San Diego. And this location, it is a stunning, stunning place. It is on an ancient whale migration route for the gray and humpback whales, and they can regularly be seen out there. And when people do come to visit or to watch the reefs being deployed, they often see whales uh, cruising by that specific area. Uh, and that's kind of a double whammy for them too. And of course the dolphins and shark and it just, I mean, the, the biodiversity out there now is increased so much more and you can really see that when you get out there. It's just beautiful. And they're uninhabited. They're uninhabited islands. And I might also add that where we deploy is all protected water, federally protected water. And it's because of these reefs. We specifically asked for that. Hmm. Um, Rob, one just one little technical question that came to my mind. These sure. days, um, people are beginning to choose the process of aquamation instead of, you know, fire cremation. Are you? Have you used those remains from aquamation? And, I have not. I have not, and I'm waiting to find one has and, and is. As far as I can tell, there are two, of course. There's the freezing, uh, the dr basically dry, uh, dry freezing someone's body uh, uh, to make them not cremains, but they're not cremains at that point. But they're they're not ashes. I, I don't. I'm not sure yeah. what you call them. I, yeah. And then <laughs> uh, and then there's the other process, which is um, uh, through essentially the very very caustic. Uh, material that's used to, to eat away the body like lye under pressure and heat. Uh, I have not used either. However, I can see an issue with the caustic. If the material is too caustic, uh, then it would have to be uh, brought down with a base prior to us uh, incorporating it into the reef. Uh, we need to match that seawater to seven and a quarter percent, and it needs to be rather inert uh, in order for marine life to uh, really find the benefit of it. Mm. For, for it to have the maximum biological productivity, it needs to be inert. Okay, so, uh, so that's an interesting question yet to be yet to be explored, I guess, in, in, yes. in the future. And then this question might be, I don't know if this is... Um, more for David or for you, Rob, but I'm just curious about, do you have any stories of what kinds of clients do you get? Who seems to be interested in using these services? I'll, I can, I can answer that. Uh, and forgive me, David, I've had my extra cup of coffee today. Oh, it's all good. All right. Um, you know, it, it varies. Uh, I'd like to point out these, these two clients, uh, we had pre-need, uh, clients and uh, sadly the mother did just pass away but these women were uh, feminists I mean uh, very quite famous feminists uh, or infamous I should say uh, within the feminist movement and it made some significant uh, contributions to to the the laws that we have as result of, uh, as the result of their efforts and are they are uh for lack of better word hippies so we've had hippies we've had uh jewish people oddly we uh supposedly not the cremation thing not great right not but uh, you know jewish people uh people from all walks of of um economic backgrounds whether very rich or not so much money and the one common denominator about all of it is just a few few points, and one was uh, the permanence of the reef. 
and that they'll always remain in that one place forever. Uh, our stability analyses was confirmed by the Naval Research Laboratory, and these will absolutely never move. Uh, even in the Hurricane 5 conditions of which we will never find at that depth or this water, they will remain in place, and it's because of their design. So you asked what, what, what other types of people we've had, biologists, teachers, um, fishermen. Um, but we, we also get, we get people from um, landlocked states as well that just have an affinity for the sea. And then we get those <clears throat> that uh, find that, you know, the, uh, we, many people get cremated and then they, they get to uh, the family's home and they're, they're on the mantle for years and then that, those parents die and they get her inherited to the next generation. And they really didn't leave any, any uh, uh, directives for the final disposition of these cremains. And through generation after generation being inherited, you know, they lose touch of who that person was. And yet they still want to honor them in a very respectful way and, and do, you know, basically satisfy all the naysayers in the family. And I found that, you know, even the naysayers in the back row don't have an objection to having the loved ones placed in these reefs because <clears throat> it benefits so much and, and, and for so long. And the, the price is certainly affordable. Uh, I mean, we can get uh, $600 is our cheapest reef, uh, less, least expensive. Uh, $875 uh, is, the, is the next one. You know, so it's, and we have financial products like our layaway program, and David will get into that, that assist them in, in to, to buying uh, a reef. It's quite affordable. Absolutely. We also have a um, family funding plan where we actually set up a crowdfunding campaign uh, and you can have different family members send money and we actually manage the campaign until it, you know, arrives at the, the cost we were going for. Um, and it's just neat to have everybody be able to chip in and um, honor the loved one that way. Uh, we have other layaway plans as well, just per month um, payment plans. And mostly what I see is we have a lot of, a lot of people buying for pre-need either for themselves or for a loved one, you know, previous to themselves passing away, whenever that may happen. And that's been a good, um, a good market because we, people want to, you know, plan their own uh, final disposition. And this really gives them a good way to do that. I think uh, the family funding plan, I think, is important to mention because it gives the family, generally when someone gets cremated, it's, there's a number of reasons. Economic is one, but the, the other two, uh, you know, they're transplants. And so family is scattered throughout the country or even the world. And so they don't really have a, uh, an opportunity to participate in, in the funeral, or at least in this case, they have an opportunity to participate in the cost and everyone would be aware of uh, who participated and how much. And uh, at the end of the day, like we just had one client, uh, the reef was, uh, they, they got a loving reef, it was 2,400. They ended up getting $17,000, uh, which was way above the cost of the reef. But the family wanted to do that because, you know, they, they knew that the, the family was in kind of economic straits and this was an opportunity for them to, to help out uh, economically when they want, when they're not there, you know, physically. And then from, from what I gathered, because you make a video of the deployment, that's a way that even people who are scattered all over the world can still participate and, and see it, see what's yeah, that's, actually happening. That's why we post it on YouTube. Everyone knows YouTube. Uh, it, it, uh, all you need is an internet connection and you can, you can view the, 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 the entire process. And it authenticates the entire thing too. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you need to know that those cremains are in that reef and that's the reef going into the sea. 
you know, that this isn't some kind of scam or, you know, uh, or they're shorting us. And this way, we want everybody to participate. So we, uh, we contact the client at every stage of the game. And even if there isn't a stage, we try and contact them every week or every two weeks uh, just to tell them that there's nothing going on and everything's going to schedule and everything's fine. They, they, need, to, they need to know that because uh, we are tasked and honored with a very important duty, and that is to respectfully deal with the cremated remains of their family. And I don't think there is a, a more important duty that we could have um, than that. You, you, you have to have uh, a way to eliminate all the human factor errors that could, that could come to bear. And so we have done that. We've taken all the risks, assessed them all, minimize the exposure to those risks and the severity should they come to bear. And so we're, we're poised to not, uh, obviously not screw up one of these because, uh, if you do that, uh, you know, that's just, that's just totally unacceptable. We, we pride ourselves on being, uh, on top of everything, you know, cause you expect that. And so, um, David, I noticed online that y there can be reefs where more than one, the remains of more than one person can be included. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's like the community reef. Um, basically, you'll send your cremains to us, and we put them in a reef along with other people's cremains, and that allows us to keep the cost down for each person. Um, and so when, once we have a certain number of cremains in the reef, then we deploy that as kind of uh, all in one. There's up, up to four sets of cremains go in one very large reef. Yep. And so we'll layer the cremains, um, uh, you know, so that they're not all mixed together. Uh, that's a concern. And of course, we don't put pets in with the, uh, the community reef. But it is up the 500 pound reef is quite large and very biologically productive. Uh, and that reef that sells for eight, $875. And a lot of families like to have that because they'll have multiple sets of cremains within the home. And this kind of uh, lets them all be together in one large reef. And of course we other have other families that like to have their individual reefs, but want to have uh, their reef placed to their loved one. And so they can pre-purchase uh, a reef and, and set aside an area next to their loved one's reef for later. And th that seems to be very popular as like a family plot, if you will. Yeah, it's and, almost like pre-purchasing a plot at a cemetery. Hmm. Which is very popular. And, and then you mentioned pet cremains. Do you uh, ever incorporate pet cremains into the We reef? do, we do. And... Uh, we're pet lovers here, obviously. Uh, so what we offer that uh, for no additional costs. Pets go in for free. I want my pets to be with me. And um, I feel that that's, that's fitting. So there is no additional cost to put in, put in your pets. I just talked to a lady with uh, eight cats. She wants to wow. put them in the reef, so. Wow, interesting. And well, there, so is, there, there is one, you know, the Pope mentioned recently that they he doesn't want cremains split up. But oftentimes um, families will want, uh, you know, they're, they're, they'll want the cremains split up amongst the family members. And so they, we, we get the question, do, do you need all of the cremains or can you use just a little bit? And of course we can use just a little bit. Uh, the idea is to get as many reefs in the water as possible so we can change the marine ecosystem. Uh, the, the cremains will actually help to bind the material, oddly enough. Uh, more cremains is better, but little, you know, if you even have just a little bit, uh, that will do as well. So David, if anyone listening is interested um, in, in learning more about this, how, where do you direct them to go? Um, just go on livingreefmemorial.com. That has 
basically all of the information you can need, our deployment locations, um, the different reefs, the prices, and has a video of us explaining exactly what happens. Um, and if you guys have any questions, obviously you can send us an email uh, on livingreefmemorial.com. Um, on the bottom, there's a contact form. With our with our with our uh, pre need uh, packages, uh, you know, we are uh, we've had to put a bond out on this location to the the government to ensure that we will deploy one hundred thousand reefs at this location. So our, we are financially committed to doing one hundred thousand reefs, regardless. And so people have poised the question, well, if I purchase a reef today uh, from you uh, and, and receive my certificate of purchase redeemable uh, for the reef that I selected at the location I selected, what is there to ensure that you will be around when the need comes? And my answer to that is, you know, I don't know. That's very honest. Uh, who, who knows? However, I can tell you that we have to do 100,000 reefs regardless. They've already been paid for. Uh, the money is already there. Uh, if, if you're concerned about that, then there are other financial products that would assist you in, in mitigating that risk. Uh, for example, insurance. We have an insurance agent who has a couple of different products out there, uh, insurance products that allows you to have a, a benefit that would cover the cost of the reefs. And of course it, uh, it grows over time. So if the costs of the reefs go up or cremation costs go up or anything like that uh, goes up, it, it matches that. And so I think that's a, that's a wonderful alternative to those concerned about our company's longevity and uh, uh, there being enough money at the end of the day to carry out uh, their wishes. Yep. And if you guys have any questions, listeners, um, you can reach us at 1-800-569-REEF or 7333. Well, we're going to answer the phone uh, and help you with any questions you may have. So that's, that's another thing about our service is that, you know, uh, I often uh, answer the phones. I enjoy speaking to the clients and they're surprised to get me uh, because uh, I'm not a salesperson, but I am versed in, in how this whole process works. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I started this and at the end of the day, what they get is um, they, they get a surety that this is going to be handled in the most respectful way possible and that it's going to be done in the most professional and lawful manner. And uh, I think that is obviously uh, a huge benefit to those considering buying a living reef memorial product. Absolutely. And David, I wanted to put a plug in. I know that you will be at, the Beautiful Dying Expo and be doing a workshop there for people in the San Diego area who want to come in and, and learn more about it. Absolutely. It's uh, mid noon on November 2nd. Uh, it's Beautiful Dying Expo at the Convention Center, and we are going to be having a little workshop. Um, come check us out. Love to see you there. Yeah, I'm excited to get to meet you there. Just for listeners, Absolutely. I've been talking with Rob Sarney, the lead biologist from Living Reef Memorial, and David Stubbers, who is in the marketing department. And this is just so fascinating. It's really been fun for me to learn about living reefs and how we could actually make a positive impact on the ocean and with the baby sea turtles as well. And I'm just so grateful to both of you for coming and sharing this information. Well, I'm very happy so to much. provide you with this information. Many people are not aware that this is even an option. And I think that's a, a tragedy for our marine ecosystems that we love so much. Everyone loves going to the beach. And uh, we want our oceans to be as healthy as possible. And these help to make that happen. 
Absolutely. Well, we're putting the word out there. So hopefully even more people will discover uh, how, how they can use a, a memorial. So um, thanks again. And hopefully I'll see both of you at the Beautiful Dying Expo in San Diego. I look forward to it. Thanks, Karen. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.